Welcome to the Concordia Publishing House podcast, where we consider everything in the light of Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm your host, Elizabeth Pittman. There's a lot to learn about the services that are included in the Lutheran Service Book. Our guest today is Reverend Dr. Paul Grimm. Dr. Grimm is going to walk us through some of the history and show us the richness that makes up the divine service. But before we get on to our conversation with Dr. Grimm, I'd like to thank our friends at the LCMS Foundation for their support of the podcast. Imagine a future where your God-given gifts continue to benefit your family and faith after you're called home to heaven. The LCMS Foundation can help you create a gift plan so that your assets, things like your retirement accounts, home or land, will leave a lasting impact on the people you love and the ministries you care about the most. Visit lcmsfoundation.org to learn more about creating your gift plan. Now on to our conversation with Dr. Paul Grimm. Dr. Grimm, welcome to the CPH podcast. Thank you for having me today. How are things with you? Tell us, tell our listeners a little bit about you and your background um, and how you came to work on the Companion to the Services. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I, I teach here at the seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I've been here for 15 years and uh, have the great opportunity to prepare future pastors and deaconesses also, but especially pastors in terms of leading worship in, in, in their churches someday. Uh, and, and uniquely preparing me for this role was the 11 years I spent prior to coming to Fort Wayne uh, at the International Center, where I was the director for the Commission on Worship. And, and it was during those 11 years that we uh, developed Lutheran Service Book and uh, many, many, many resources that came along with that book. And prior to that, I had spent eight and a half years. I was a pastor in a large church in, in the Milwaukee area and was privileged to serve wonderful people there for, for a number of years. Well, the Lutheran Service Book, Companion to the Services, is a marvelous resource. Um, since it's come out, I've been at any number of events, and it sells out immediately when we have it. Pastors are always looking for it. Um, so it's it's been really neat to see how it's been received. Why is it called Companion to the Services and not Companion to the Liturgy? Good question. I, I, and actually, you know, when we first in, envisioned this, we talked about the, we call it the desk edition is what we were calling this book, you know. 15 years ago as we were anticipating what it might be, or 20 years ago even already. And uh, the desk edition for the liturgy is what we said, and, and then the desk edition for the hymns. Well, three years ago, the companion to the hymns was published. And, and so they set, they set the goal, and, or a, a pattern, I should say, in terms of how we would name these books. And, and of course, one could have said companion to the liturgy, but, but we chose not to. And, and the, the reason is kind of unpacked in the very first essay in the book by Thomas Winger, from Ontario up in St. Catharines at the seminary there, and in which he does a, a masterful job of kind of teasing out the distinctions of words, especially as the reformers understood them, in a way that really, I think, is beneficial. And, and we really try to let that kind of govern the language that we use throughout the entire book, uh, so, so that we would have a, a consistency to, to as, as much as possible between the 12 authors that were part of this process. Um, and, you know, and, and it, it kind of stems around, you know, I think, sometimes misunderstandings regarding the word liturgy. If, if you ask somebody, what's the liturgy, they'll often point to an order of service. They'll say, oh, the liturgy on page 184 or 151 or whatever. And, 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 and that's, a, that's a conventional way of speaking, and we all know what we're talking about in a sense. But when you look at the confessions, the Lutheran confessions, you see that the word liturgy actually in its more concrete or narrow definition, is, is not talking about a service or an order of any type like that, but it's actually talking about God's service for us, his service through Christ, who effects the greatest service to the world by giving his life for the world. And, and that that service is, is, is what um, kind of defines his role in, in relationship to us now as he continues to serve his church through the, the, the distribution of his forgiveness in word and sacrament. And, and so it's, it's actually the gift itself is, you know, the, the life and salvation of Christ that he gives us through these means that really is the liturgy properly understood. And, and so uh, Dr. Winger nicely kind of organizes his thoughts and, and, and helps to clarify these definitions to some degree, because one can talk about the liturgy in this sense as, you know, the, the word of God being delivered and delivering God's gifts and the sacraments, likewise, the forgiveness being bestowed on us. I mean, that that's a, it's a divinely mandated uh, gift for us. I mean, God says, you shall do this, you know, baptize, 
take, eat, take, drink. Um, that word of God proclaimed is, is, is part of his mandate for us. And so we don't get to say, well, well, if you like to do it, you can. If you don't, you don't have to. Or, or, you have to. It's, it's what constitutes the church itself and her work. That it's, it's where the gospel is proclaimed faithfully and the word and the sacraments are administered rightly. That's, that's, that's the church in her definition. And so I mean, when you then talk about something like an order of service, I, that you know, is, is not specifically mandated in the scriptures in terms of you must do it like this with these 14 components in this particular order. You know, over the course of time, a particular order has clearly come into play, much of it dating all the way back to nearly the beginning, as best we can tell. But, but the, in the particulars, there isn't a, a divine mandate to say you must sing a Sanctus or you must sing an Agnus Dei. We do, because we, we've seen from a long period of use, centuries and centuries, that these are great benefits to us in unpacking and delivering the gift of God to us. But, but you, you can't really say in the same sense that you can say the liturgy properly understood is, is divinely mandated. I mean, how it's delivered to us, I mean, there has been variations over the centuries. And even when you look within Lutheran service book, at, let's say the, the five different settings of the divine service that we have, each of them is very similar, and yet there are distinctive differences. Different music that the words are set to, even different translations, um, and, and sometimes a slight different ordering of things, uh, which demonstrates, again, the, the, the rich tradition that we have. And, and when you then dig into the history, as this book does in, in some detail, you begin to see that you know, this, this kind of continuity is very strong throughout the ages, and yet regional variations, different times and places, there have been adjustments that have been made. So, so oh, good. That, that takes to the point of why we say we call it the service or companion to the service is a, a much more general term to talk about the kind of the whole realm of things that this book is going to cover. Well, tell us where do we get the divine service from? You, you mentioned that there is that continuity, but where does it come from? Right. Well, I mean, ultimately, it comes. I, I mean, we, we have the kind of the essence of it in, in, in very simple form already in the late New Testament, or I should say late in the ministry of Jesus after his resurrection. When he appears to the Emmaus disciples, for example, he teaches them along the way. And then in the breaking of bread, he reveals himself, you know, teaching and dining. Uh, he then appears shortly after that to the other disciples uh, in the upper room. You know, behind, they're behind locked doors, where again, he teaches them, as, as Luke records in, in chapter 24. And he also eats with them. And, and so you, you already kind of have this pattern starting to come into place. Uh, the next Sunday, the disciples are meeting again. Thomas is with them this time. And so you almost get now the Sunday repetition, that the Lord's Day is already starting to take shape as, as the day when these Christians are, are gathering. And, and so that, that basic pattern of teaching and eating are, are, are already set in place, even kind of reflective of Old Testament practices, and certainly Jesus' ministries. He would go into the homes of tax collectors, sinners, even Pharisees. He would teach, and they would dine together. It's just now that now, post-resurrection, that dining together takes on new significance based upon that last you know, Passover meal that Jesus has with his disciples when he institutes the sacrament. And now that dining is going to be more than just sharing bread and wine. They're sharing and receiving his body and blood as well. So would you say that pattern of teaching and dining is the oldest part of the divine service? I, I, in terms of its contour, yes, I think right. so. And in a way that was described very interestingly by Wilhelm Lea, who was that pastor in Germany who trained you know, um, pastors to come over here to help them with all the German immigrants in the um, 1830s, 1840s. He, he, in one place, describes the divine service. He says, you know, as, as you go through the beginning of the service and you're singing the Kyrie and the glory and you hear the readings, etc., you, you reach this main point at the top where you hear the word of Christ in the gospel reading and then preaching upon that. He says, you get to the top of that mountain and he says, you see, ah, there's another mountain we're going to ascend. So you kind of dip down for a while when you have the prayers and the offering, etc. But now we begin the ascent again to the second half, which is you know, the, the service of the sacrament, which reaching its high point with the words of Christ. Again, the instant words of institution and the distribution then of those gifts that are given to us in the sacrament. And so he kind of does it with kind of a topography description a little bit. You know, you ascend the mountain, come down, you ascend another mountain. And, and you kind of see that in the earliest descriptions of the service. Uh, Justin Martyr in the middle of the second century describes the service kind of similarly. He, he kind of gives a little blow-by-blow blow of a play-by-play, I should say, of, of you know the first part of the service in very simple terms. 
And then the second part of the service, in fairly simple terms, he doesn't give us actual texts, but he gives us a good sense of this order of the service that is, is, is in place. And really, ever since, that has been the basic shape of the service. We hear the word of God proclaimed to us. We then receive God's Son in his body and blood. So when, when would you say that this divine service as we know it today was more or less settled? Mm -hmm. Right, in terms of some of the particulars now, yeah, mm -hmm. going beyond just that basic yeah. shape. Right. Sure, uh, you know, you, you start getting some indications already quite early on, uh, but, it, it, you know, especially prior to the Constantinian um, change that takes place when Christianity becomes legalized in the early fourth century. In those first centuries, there's always a threat of persecution. It's a, it's a difficult time. They weren't always under persecution, but you know, they couldn't really kind of establish themselves as firmly. So they met in homes. In homes, you're not going to have as elaborate of a service because you're just kind of all cramped into a room standing. And so the service was much simpler. But then, you know, once the, the um, Christianity is legalized and eventually becomes the preferred religion of the empire, well, then, you know, they can move into larger buildings. No one's going to confiscate their buildings, you know, if, if there's a persecution. And they, and they really start to have um, a kind of elaboration that takes place. And that's where you start to see some of these parts of the service we know so well really becoming evident. I mean, the beginning of the third century, we have documented the oldest part of the service with certainty, and that's the beginning of the communion service, where the pastor has this little dialogue with the congregation. The Lord be with you, he says, and they reply, and with your spirit. And then he says, lift up your hearts, and they say, we have them with the Lord, and then let us give thanks to the Lord our God. You know, it's fitting for us to do that, is the response. And I mean, that's already documented early third century. I have no doubt that it was much older than that. I mean, the author was not making this up. It's like, oh, here's a new way to do the service. I'm sure it had been around probably for 100 years, maybe all the way back to the time of the apostles. We don't know for sure. But by the 4th century now, as Christianity really is kind of sinking roots as, as the church is you know, kind of in this for the long haul, so to speak, you start to see the service take on a lot more familiarity. And so you can look at orders of service, especially from some of the Eastern parts of Christianity, you know, down in Egypt, in Jerusalem, Palestine, over in Constantinople, in Turkey. And you, you listen to the service, and they always start with that same dialogue, those three little couplets between the pastor and the congregation. And then they'll go on to say, it is fitting and right, fitting and right, truly fitting and right, that we should at all times and places give thanks, just kind of like how we have it. And then it'll go on to start talking about this, and eventually start talking about the angels and the archangels, and they're all joined together in this unending hymn of praise and with, with much more flowery language than I'm giving you. Uh, and it leads into the Sanctus, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Uh, and, so, and so you really get a sense by the fourth century that at least that part of the service, I mean, we, we are heirs of that tradition uh, in, in one way or another. Usually ours is a little more simplified than kind of the very effusive language that they used. The, the first part of the service, so when we think about Kyrie, Gloria, that comes a little later. Kyries maybe are in there at that time. Certainly in the Eastern tradition, they like their litanies. On uh, the Western tradition, the, the glory doesn't get established for a while yet. Um, and like the Agnus Dei, just before distribution, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. By the 8th century, that's coming into play. And it's mostly used as just kind of some a, a musical interlude to give the pastor time to break the loaves of bread into pieces, that you know, bite-sized pieces. And they, they would actually sing it as many times as they had to until, until he was done with his work. And once they moved to having wafers already prepared, you know, individual wafers, then they didn't really need that music, but they kept it because they liked it. And that's when they then reduced it down to just singing it three times as, as we know it today. So by the fourth century, you're beginning to get a good sense of some aspects of the service, but along the way, various parts will be added. The creed won't really be added to about the 10th century. So it, it kind of comes in fits and spurts. And most of the time we have utterly no idea who added it or even perhaps exactly where it was added or when it was added. It just kind of comes into it. It's subsumed into the church's practice. Uh, and so there's, there's some great anonymity in many ways with many parts of the service, but that just demonstrates the church in her movement toward, you know, kind of finding the best way to go about this, kind of just receiving the best that they can along, in, along the way. Is the divine service still changing today? I, I mean, I dare say it's always been adapted to, in one way or another. 
Uh, I mean, at the, and, and yes, it is. At the time of the Reformation, for example, you, you, you see some changes that take place. And there's various reasons for that. I mean, there was certainly theological reasons. And even the Roman Church would sometimes make very you know, make adaptations, change things, delete things that maybe even they realized were a little on the edge in terms of theological propriety. Uh, but, but for Luther and company, for example, it was very much definitely a need to, to, to make some reforms. Uh, and and it, it centered around, you know, what was really kind of the most significant concerns Luther had, and that was related to, you know, salvation and how God brings that salvation to us, because in many ways the Roman Mass had become nothing more than a, a, a work to be performed. Uh, and, and by the time of Luther, most Christians did not receive the sacrament anymore. I, already in the 13th century, the, the, at a Roman at a council, the Fourth Lateran Council, they had to um, issue a statement. It's like a like a convention resolution saying all Christians must go to communion at least once a year on Easter, which suggests that they weren't even going then, uh, and it, because it just became a work the priest performed, and he really didn't need the congregation. And in fact, you know, besides that Sunday mass where they were required to be in attendance in some way or another. Uh, the rest of the week, the priest just kept saying masses day after day, multiple times every day. Uh, these private masses, which were, you know, for the intentions of people who had died, it was it was a source of income, just like indulgences and viewing relics, and you know, you know, all these different ways in which the church kind of had had um, taken, you know, the, the free gift of salvation that's so clearly proclaimed in in the scriptures, and had had twisted it in a way that allowed, you know. The, the the onus to be put on us to do something that earns in some fashion or another that forgiveness, and some people were more blatant in that heresy than others. But but Luther saw clearly that this was a a significant issue that was leading people astray, and and so I mean his desire to provide a a purified order of service that would allow the gospel to shine through in a clear way. So the service changed then. Has it changed since Luther? Sure. I, you know, it, it's 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 continually undergone adaptations, not radical adaptations, but as an example, just even musical elaboration. Um, from the time of Luther to, the, for, let's say, the first century after the Reformation began, you know, there were Lutheran composers writing hundreds of different settings of, of various parts of the service for choirs to sing. Much of it even still in Latin. They didn't drop Latin. They added German, but they didn't even drop always the Latin. But, they, I mean, people could hear the service, the different parts of the service sung to different melodies, different musical settings by choirs, sometimes simple little things for just a small choir, sometimes very large choral settings. So there was always adaptations in, in one way or another. But, again, that continuity of seeing, you know, the, the two peaks in the service and to see, you know, very much similarities of the different components of the service as we know them today, I mean, that, that has remained quite consistent. It's, it's been more kind of fine-tuning, slight adjustments along the way. What are some of the things that are taken into consideration before anything is either added or removed from the divine service? Mm. Yeah, I... I mean, the example of Luther again, I mean, basically his, his principle was, is it delivering Christ or is it obscuring the work of Christ? And, and he had clear problems with, you know, the Roman mass and the practices there where what they did was obscuring the work of Christ. And if you do that, well, then you, you, you've just kind of taken the substance of Christianity out of the picture. And so that became kind of the touchstone in many ways for much of his work. And, and he really performs a significant just kind of removal of those parts of the service. And most of that really happened right around the point of the, the communion service, you know, the service of the sacrament. You had prayers just before that preface dialogue, the Lord be with you, etc. And then you had a bunch of prayers that followed that after the sanctus that, I mean, those were the main offending culprits. And so, you know, if, if they're going to cause, a, you know, confusion in terms of what Christ has done and what we're doing, if it's going to kind of give a sense of, you know, we've got something to contribute to our salvation, or as Luther says, you know, does it smell of sacrifice? And uh, if, if, in terms of us sacrificing something for God, then then he just basically said it has to go. I mean, other reformers were a little more careful, or not careful is the wrong word, you know, maybe a little more circumspect. They didn't just delete things, but they might reword things to make it more acceptable in some cases. Um, and, and in terms of adding things, it, it's usually, it, it, it's 
I think, always been seen as a, a churchly addition, and that it's not just one person saying, well, let's do add this now and we'll use this. But it's the church that comes in, into an acceptance of, of, of something that might be uh, included in, in the regular order of service that wasn't before. I, a good example of that might be something as simple as the addition of the Old Testament reading to the, to the service. Um, Old Testament readings kind of dropped out by about the 6th or 7th century, and they would simply read epistles and gospels. And then for the next 1,400 years, they read epistles and gospels and did not read Old Testament readings on Sundays. It was the mid-20th century when the Roman Catholic Church initiated some significant reforms uh, that they reformed the lectionary, the, the readings that are read from Sunday to Sunday, and, and they recovered that Old Testament reading, which had been lost for so long. Lutherans in some cases, we're very much interested in, in some of these changes. And, and so the Old Testament readings have come back into our practice as well. Uh, but it's been a churchly addition, not just one person saying, let's do this, and, and now we're set. Another example would be something like, this is the feast, uh, you know, an alternate to the glory and excelsis at the beginning of the service. And now, you know, the glory has been in use since the 10th century, without a doubt, in the, in the Western church, and some before that as well. So adding something, you know, as a replacement for the glory it would seem to be maybe um, a little bold for the church to do it. Lutherans in the late 20th century did that uh, as, as they prepared Lutheran book of worship. And then the, the, the version that we chose instead was Lutheran worship and now Lutheran service book as well. Uh, this is the feast is, is, is provided as an alternate, not a replacement, but an alternate to the Gloria. And, and I think a fitting one. It, it's, it, I wouldn't want to give up the glory, and I think that should re, re, kind of retain pride of place simply because of its longevity and its pedigree. But this is the feast is, is quite significant, I think, in many ways. Like the glory, it's a, it's a Christological hymn. It focuses on Christ, on his work for us. Uh, it introduces some other themes we don't find in the glory, especially the eschatological themes. Um, you know, that Christ who has been slain is, is already begun his reign among us. Uh, we take up the song of the angels, just like we do in the Gloria, when we sing glory be to God on high. Uh, and, and so in some ways, it's, it's, it's just kind of like a parallel canticle. But another example of the church in her wisdom saying this would be a fitting canticle for us to use and, and, and making use of it. What's distinctly Lutheran about the divine service? I, I think you have to say it delivers Christ. And, and, you know, and when Luther goes about the reform, he, he makes that point in many ways. As, as he starts to kind of walk through the service and describing what's going on, you know, he'll speak very highly of things like the Gloria and the Kyrie and the lectionary and Sanctus. And, I mean, he says all these things are fine expressions because they, they are you know, proclaiming the truth of God's you know, service for us and what he's, he's accomplished for us. And only, when he gets to those sacrificial parts of the service that are all kind of skewing everything and, and, and starting to obscure that work of Christ, that, you know, that's when he starts to bring out the scalpel, I guess you could say. But, but it is proclaiming Christ. I mean, or as we Missouri Synod Lutherans especially will say it, you know, proclaiming law and gospel. And, and that's, you know, the gospel comes through clearly and, and, and strongly in, in um, all that we say and do. How, when you look, when we look at the divine service, how does it compare um, to other denominations and other faith traditions in terms of the, of the service? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, at the time of the Reformation, you already begin to see kind of th the trajectory for, for many of these churches. And as you, start, you begin to see this splintering of, of the church. Uh, the Church of England, under Thomas Cranmer's leadership, you know, th their revision of the service retains much of the order that we're familiar with. Uh, he chooses not to just cut out all these prayers that were offensive to Luther, but he, he rewards them in a way that kind of makes them acceptable. Uh, but, but that was their tradition to follow. But even in his lifetime, um, Cranmer will make another revision of the Book of Common Prayer just a few years later in 1552. And he starts to mess with things a little differently. He's kind of changing the tradition a little bit um, and moving things in different order and leaving little parts out here or there. So you know, even he's showing a little bit of a sense of, eh, we can be a little freer with this, but not nearly so much like, say, some of the more radical elements of the Reformation, the Swinglians and the Reformed. Uh, first of all, the, the sacrament as a regular feature in the church is no longer 
um, the case. I, unlike the Augsburg Confession, which says that the Mass is celebrated every Lord's Day in our churches, uh, they don't. I mean, it becomes you know, the occasional service, maybe four times a year. And, and, and so it, it, it takes on a very different character. If you look at Calvin's order of service, John Calvin in Geneva, there's no congregational responses like that with that dialogue at the beginning of the communion service. There's just this long exhortation that he gives. And but again, they're only going to hear it four times a year or so. So it's it's not like it's every Sunday they're being um, overwhelmed with with this you know paragraph after paragraph, just kind of uh, kind of exhorting the congregation. So I mean, they really don't have the tradition. They don't sing the Gloria. They don't sing the Sanctus. They don't sing Agnus Dei. All those parts that just we kind of take for granted as being part of the service. Uh, in, in our own time, I mean, there's been various movements along the way. I, the mid 20th century was a, a unique period of time. There was kind of a convergence, not only with you know between some Protestants, but with Roman Catholics as, as the Roman Catholic Church was undergoing its own reforms. Uh, in, in the early 70s, you had an attempt by by Protestant churches in this country to develop common liturgical language. You know, they they wanted the same. Everybody used the same. You know, translations of things like you know the the the, ben, the preface, the Lord be with you, uh, and, and and other places, uh, and and that even you start to see some Methodists using and Presbyterians using some of these liturgical forms they really hadn't used for for some centuries. Uh, some of that started to splinter again in the last couple of decades, especially with you know kind of the devolution of our use of language. Uh, that this push toward exclu- inclusive language. I mean, the whole business of wokeness now, it, it comes to a point where a lot of churches can't even agree again on, on the same translations they should use because some would like to re- have retained, you know, faithful, literal translations of these ancient texts and others say, well, that's too exclusive. I don't like those pro- masculine pronouns, etc. And so it's kind of falling apart, it looks like, a little bit again at this point in time. So, well, and that's... Again, part of the beauty of our, our Lutheran tradition, where we do stay fixed on the Word and on keeping a Christ centered, and not not falling prey to the whims of the culture around us. So, beyond the obvious, what are we doing in the divine service? Are we, um, as the congregants, are we active? Are we passive? What's what's happening there? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, but but maybe not in ways people understand, or I mean, they can easily be misunderstood. Of course, I, and you know, at the time of the Reformation, or prior, let's say, to the Reformation, the, the Roman Church, and then before you know, Luther starts to un- unmask the abuses. In, in many ways, the people were utterly passive in terms of their participation in the service. I mean, they don't know the language; it's not their language; it's Latin. Uh, the service is conducted f- kind of at a distance from them. The altar is far in the front of the church, behind a screen usually. They can maybe see through little openings in the screen to see the priest raise up the elements during the consecration. Um, but they, they can't hear anything. The priest actually whispers much of the service. And, and Luther even quips at one point. He says, well, it's, it serves them right. You know, and thank God that he's ordered it this way, that you know, these abominable words they're saying are whispered only by them, so the only they can hear these terrible things, and you know, that'll just suit them well if they end up in hell with because of that. And the people are spared from hearing this horrible theology. It's kind of a, a, a sarcastic little dig at them. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I mean, their participation was limited to kind of doing their own devotions while the, the mass is being set up front by the priests, and the priests are doing all of the, the, the magic, so to speak. Um, you know, and, and Luther wants full participation in the sense that, A, people can understand what's going on. So the call for the vernacular to be used. And, and, and that becomes you know, a significant opportunity for the people now to hear the word of God proclaimed directly to them and, and for them in, in a language that they can understand. But in terms of the service itself, you know, are we active participants? Are we just receptive you know, vessels that, that receive? It, it, it's both. But one has to get the the kind of the priorities right. Uh, you know, Jesus describes his ministry as one who came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, at, at the Last Supper, in Luke records that Jesus makes the statement, "I am among you as one who serves." And 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 that word "serve" really becomes, I think, a significant word that that even in our hymnal becomes evident. If you take a look at the introduction to the hymnal, which is on page eight, way up in the front, 
uh, usually skipped by many people who reads introductions to books. But but it, it talks there. I mean, it, it kind of the whole first three paragraphs kind of is a play on the word serve or builds off of that word. You know, our Lord is among us as one who serves. And then it kind of describes how he did that. He came, suffered, died, rose again, ascended into heaven. But it says he still serves us, serving us now through the places he's promised he'll be with his forgiveness in life. And so he serves us through that preaching of the word, through absolution, where that forgiveness is spoken into our ears, through baptism, through the Lord's Supper. Um, but then that th the third point comes along and says, his service calls forth our service. Uh, not offering something to God to appease his wrath, but our service of thanks and praise for what he's given. Sometimes I liken it to breathing. You, know, you really can't exhale until you first inhale. Well, the inhalation when we're talking about our relationship with God is him breathing life into us. I mean, he breathes life into Adam right there, you know, at the creation. And we dead sinners need life breathed into us continually. And that's what he does through the gospel. That's what he does through the sacraments. He breathes life into us. But when life is breathed into us, we then cannot help but exhale. And that exhalation is to acknowledge the gifts he's given, to give thanks to him, to praise him, to tell the neighbor what he's done for us. So there is an active part that we play, but it's always in response to the life that he has given to us first. Well, there's such beauty in the divine service and just those rhythms. And I, I appreciate you joining us today to kind of share the history. And it's, it is really fascinating when we peel back the layers and we look at the, the history and the tradition that, we're part of every Sunday as we as we worship um, well, and, the divine service. And, and see what the service companion, the, the, the companion to the services does, you know, and it, it's quite a big book, but it, it gives, you know, it, it does several things. I mean, it, there's lots of different types of essays in the book covering a variety of topics, but I would say probably the, the largest portion of it is on the divine service, both uh, you know, 150 pages of historical development that just kind of walks through from the earliest days all well from the Old Testament, New Testament to the you know to the present time, in terms of the development of the service, kind of these these changes that have gone on along the way and, and why they happened, but then comes about two hundred or so page commentary on the divine service, where literally we look at every single part, we just methodically go through each part, and we you know we consider what what's the historical background here, how did this enter our service. Uh, do we know who started doing it first, or where at least, perhaps? And then you know, we look at the theological significance. What does this mean? Why do we? What, what, what is implied by what we're saying here, and, and why have we retained this all these years? Uh, we, we consider the fact that it's not the same in each service. There's other options one could sometimes do, variations on various parts of the service. It's you know The service is not a straight jacket. You just kind of get wrapped your arms in there and you got to do it just like the same way all the time. And then there's, there's rich treasures, even within Lutheran service book, uh, for, for bringing kind of freshness to that service. Even if you sing the same service every Sunday, there's, there's places for variation uh, that allow us to, to hear this familiar text, maybe with different music, or maybe you sing a, the, the text in a paraphrase, so it kind of just forces you to think about those words in a little different way. I mean, there's just a richness there uh, kind of waiting to be explored, and, and the companion tries to help pastors and musicians kind of come to, to realize all these options that are available for them. And, and then we even provide guidance for the pastor, sometimes for the musician too, on how you actually do the service. What do you, in, when you're doing the service, what do you do? Do you stand here? Do you turn here? Do you lift your hands there? I mean, all those kinds of details that, that help one to, to bring a, you know, to, to, do a, to lead a service that is done with dignity uh, and, and beauty, uh, but fitting for wherever the location is, whether it's a big fancy church building, whether it's a storefront. I mean, each, in each case, it'll, it'll look a little different but yet it'll be the same gifts that are being delivered. The Companion is a fascinating resource. And I would say for pastors and lay people alike, you know, for our listeners, we'll link to it in the show notes. I encourage you to go take a look at it because you, you will learn a lot and it will enrich your, your worship on, on Sunday morning. So Dr. Grimm, thank you very much for joining us today and walking us through some of the history and, and the nuances of the Companion to the Services. You're welcome. It's been my privilege. Listeners, till next time. 
Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Concordia Publishing House podcast. I pray that this time was valuable to your walk with Christ. We'd love to connect with listeners on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Concordia Pub. Visit cph.org for more resources to grow deeper in the gospel.